We've been doing this series for the real God. Uh, Tony wrapped that up last week. If you guys missed some of those messages, go online and, and check those out. Go back and, and, uh, and listen to those. And all these uh, subjects that we talked about really are building blocks. They're all important. Uh, they're all different uh, aspects of God's character that are true and, and uh, necessary for us to understand. Uh, some of these topics we've experienced uh, firsthand and some we, we don't know much about. Um, but uh, these things are true and good and right. So as I was considering, as I was looking at a blank page, uh, so to speak, uh, prepping for today and praying about what to share, um, what, I was, uh, what I was dwelling on was uh, this, kind of this question, you know, what is our response to these attributes of God? What is our response to God's faithfulness? What is our response to God's hope? What is our response to God's love or God's justice? What are we going to do with these things? And as I was reflecting on that and, and uh, thinking about the things that God has been showing me over the last little bit, I was remembering that a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus changes everything. That blank page uh, is filled with hope when we encounter Jesus. And Jesus in his life and uh, the words that we have recorded in the Gospels, Jesus painted uh, pictures of new life. And he did this without creating new list of things to do. In fact, it, uh, if he did anything, he expanded the, the old list to just show us how inadequate we really are. That's not exactly what we want to hear, right? But Jesus said things like, you've heard it said this way, but let me tell you, it's this way. Uh, things like, you know, you keep the law, uh, you, you haven't murdered anyone, but you've hated your brother, you're guilty of breaking that law. And Jesus did that with, uh, with other elements of the law as well, but he showed us how much trouble we were in by doing that, how in inadequate we were. But he didn't stop there. So many religions keep going that direction. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta just keep trying harder. Just gotta keep doing this thing. You gotta dig a little deeper. But Jesus says, you can't dig deep enough. You can't try hard enough. But what I'm going to do is show you how much I care. You can't do this, but I can and I will. And now 2,000 years later, we're here on a Sunday morning celebrating what, uh, what Jesus did. In a couple of weeks, we celebrate Advent, and then that leads into Christmas, where we celebrate his incarnation, the fact that he came to this earth. And then a few months after that, we celebrate Easter, when Jesus uh, died on the cross and rose again on the third day for all those things that we couldn't do ourselves. What an amazing thing that is. That's our king. That's the king who loves you. This morning, my prayer for us is that we will be refreshed. New Christians have passion. New Christians make mistakes based on being just simply naive and ignorant. And old Christians make mistakes too. And I'm one of those old Christians who makes mistakes. My mistakes, our mistakes are based on crustiness and bad habits. We need the Holy Spirit to breathe fresh on us again. To breathe life into these dry bones again. I had this picture in the, the first service, and um, I should have shared it, but then I didn't. And then between services, Paul uh, 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 prayed uh, um, that there would be fire in these bones that Jesus has breathed on. And the picture that I had in the first service was um, of these bones just, just shaking, just vibrating. Vibrating with life. <laughs> the life that Christ has given vibrating in anticipation of what God is about ready to do. May that be us this morning. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would just come and fill this place again. Fill us again with your Holy Spirit. These words uh, of truth that you presented so long ago, make them alive in us again, that we can uh, actually live these things out and proclaim your name among Sheridan County and among the nations. Lord, thank you for equipping us and entrusting us with your work. Uh, Lord, may we honor you with everything that we do. May the words of our mouths and, and the actions of our hands bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, we need your refreshing. And I pray this morning that you would refresh us once again. We can't do this thing on our own. We, we absolutely have to have you. And Lord, help us to lean on you for everything that we need. Lord, be in this place this morning with us. Or maybe more accurately, open our eyes to see you where you already are. 
Amen. All right. So the message this morning, my not top 10 download, is the blessing of submission. The blessing of submission. And submission is necessary for us as Christians. But let's define these terms a little bit. Uh, we ask for blessing so often. God bless this nation. You know, we hear that prayer often. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, bless this meal. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we do that. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we don't, uh, at least in our culture, we don't have a great concept of a blessing. I was uh, with a group of pastors from around the country a couple weeks ago and, and uh, just kind of asked this question. Have, have you guys ever received your father's blessing on the work that you're doing? And most of the guys were kind of like, well, maybe. I mean, and some of them were like, yeah, most definitely. But most people were like, well, you know, I, I actually don't know what that, I don't know what that blessing would look like. I don't know what that means. So I think for us this morning, we have to define blessing. We could probably take a whole lot of messages to talk about this subject and all the different ways that it shows up and how necessary it is. And how necessary it is for, for us as parents to bless our children or as uh, leaders to bless the people that we lead or as bosses to bless the people that work for you. But when we talk about blessing in the context of scripture, I think the, the, about the most simple definition that we can uh, operate on is this. We're, we're asking for God's favor and protection. We're asking for God's favor and protection. And the fact of the matter is that God has already favored you. He has chosen you. Uh, blessing is the, the antithesis, the opposite of selfishness. Selfishness says, I want it all. I'm going to take it all and keep it for myself. Blessing says, everything I have, I'm sharing with you. And that's exactly what God the Father did. He shared his son with us. When we think about uh, maybe, maybe a modern context that we can understand, a, a father's blessing on a marriage proposal. Uh, some of you men uh, have gone to uh, approach your, your now father-in-law to ask for your wife's hand in marriage. And um, I don't know about you guys, but when I did that, I already knew what, the, what, what uh, my wife's father was going to say. Um, but I was still nervous and weird and uh, awkward about the whole thing. Because it's, it's such a big thing. To ask, like, I, I, I want your blessing, I want your approval, I want your protection on this. I want you to fight for me in this. That's what we're asking for, men, when we ask for, uh, ask the Father for our wife's hand in marriage. That's a good and honorable thing to do. And hopefully you've experienced the, the blessing as I did from uh, the now father-in-law. That is like, yep, yep, I, yep, everything I have, I'm giving to you. And I'm going to fight uh, for my daughters to have that when they're 35 and I finally give them permission to get married. I, I noticed an irony yesterday. Uh, uh, the girls, I don't know what happened. Uh, the girls were asking when they get to move out of the house or something. I'm like, well, I'm kicking you out at 18, but you can't get married until you're 35. So I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, we'll figure that out when the time comes. Submission. Good time to talk about submission, right? Submission for our purposes this morning. Uh,
when that puppy goes out in the front yard, he's going on a leash. <laughs> um, yeah, he's free, but I'm putting him on a leash and t- until I can trust him. Um, and as soon as I can trust him, then he's, he's free to go off the leash because I know he'll obey when I tell him to come. We're getting there. We're making progress. Um, but uh, it's taking a little while. Uh, yeah, same thing. Like at night, I'm not going to let the puppy wander around the house. We'll wake up with the house completely chewed up. You know, we'll put him in the crate for now until uh, we can trust him at night. And it isn't that I don't love the puppy, you know? It isn't that I don't like him. I just don't trust him, <laughs> right? <laughs> but think about this in the context of our, of our own spirituality, our own relationship with Christ. You know, uh, the law is not there uh, for those who are free in Christ. The law is there for the lawless. Um, Christ came to fulfill the law, uh, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And now we have freedom in Christ. The psalmist 119, the long one. We could read a whole long portion of this. I'm just going to read a couple of verses for you guys this morning. But the psalmist in the Old Testament understood this. I will keep on obeying your instructions forever and ever. I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. There's that submission. I walk in freedom, but I'm devoting myself to your commandments. And I will speak to kings about your laws, and I will not be ashamed. How I delight in your commands, how I love them. And again, go back and, and read this whole uh, psalm. I know it's long, but, uh, but it really speaks to this over and over and over again. We have freedom in Christ and through Christ, but also for Christ. I talked about a, an encounter with Jesus and how that uh, changes everything. And a, re- a reasonable response to an encounter with Jesus, um, well, Four things come to mind. One, we are free to walk in communion with the Father. We didn't have that freedom before. We couldn't even approach the Father before Christ. Uh, it's, not, it's not an option. We were not in right standing with the Father. But Christ came, Christ lived, Christ died, Christ rose again so that we could have right relationship with him and the Father. And our common union is Christ. Number two, we can walk in communion. We have freedom to walk in communion with other believers. Again, our common union is Christ. This walking in communion with other believers, it includes accountability. Well, accountability is the opposite of freedom, right? (laughs) But if you want to be free, you're accountable to somebody. We are free to have fellowship with one another. We're free to confess our sins to one another. We're free to come to the table together, as we will in a little while. A third response comes to mind when we talk about a reasonable response to Jesus changing everything, and it's this, that we are now free to change ourselves. Uh, This could get carried in the wrong direction, so be careful with this, and I'm trying to be careful in how I express this. But you have a role, you have a responsibility in your own walk. Some people have this idea that, you know, oh yeah, I prayed that prayer that one time and now I'm free in Christ. No, follow that up with action. Follow that up by developing the spiritual disciplines. Follow that up by uh, what James says, by caring for the orphan and widow in their distress and keeping oneself, uh, and, uh, keeping oneself from being corrupted, polluted by the world, by evil. You have a role in this. You have responsibility in this. Yes, Christ did it all. Christ paid for it all. And now he's asking for your participation in all. A psychologist friend of ours, uh, and you've been hearing us say this for a couple of years now, uh, behavior tells the truth. Behavior tells the truth. Our actions speak of the truth of a transformed life. If you're living no differently, if your speech has not changed... If your lifestyle, if your spending habits haven't changed. I, I want to talk to you about your encounter with Jesus Christ. Fourth thing, fourth reasonable response is freedom to change the world. This is a big one. And it's a hard one. And it's way bigger than we are. But we do the things that God has given us control over. We, we exercise the, 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 the talents that we've been given. We use the time we've been given. We use uh, all the things that God has given us to change the world around us. Let our lives, let your lives be evidence 
of the work of Christ in you, demonstrating the good news. Not just telling the good news, but demonstrating the good news. Again, that face-to-face encounter with Jesus changes everything. It is possible to see Jesus face-to-face and not change. We have examples of that in Scripture as well. And I want you to listen and see if there's some things in here that maybe apply to you. We have, or these folks that I mentioned, I'll include myself in that. Uh, I don't think I misspoke when I said we have. um, Perceived responsibilities that we don't want to let go of. Someone was walking with Jesus and and wanted to be Jesus' disciple. Jesus called him, and, and the guy responded, let me go bury my father. In other words, he's saying, let me go take care of my earthly duties. And Jesus, I'm sure he was kind of scratching his head, and he had a whole lot of words he wanted to say. But he basically said, your responsibility is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Yes, there's things that you need to do, but, but your primary responsibility is not to care for a dead and dying world, but to take the kingdom, uh, take this message of the kingdom of God to the dead and dying world. There's a big difference there. But we have perceived responsibilities. We have things that that weigh us down, and we uh, feel like sometimes those responsibilities limit our ability to follow Christ. We also have perceived sacrifices that we have to make, and sometimes we're not willing to make those sacrifices. The rich young ruler in Luke 18, um, you know, he's having this conversation with Jesus. Hey, what do I need to do? And Jesus says, well, sell everything. Give it all to the poor. And, and the guy's like, really? I, I have a lot. I'm not sure if I'm willing to do that. We don't know how that story ended. Um, I'm kind of an optimistic guy, and I would like to think that um, that, that guy turned and, and uh, did the thing that Jesus asked him to do. But, but I also know the reality for many of us and for myself at times is, uh, you know, there's sacrifices that I think God might be asking me to make, and I'm not willing to do that. There's also perceived poverty, poverty of the soul, uh, not just economic poverty. Um, when I talk about poverty of the soul, I'm talking about not a lack of resources, but a lack of potential a lack of uh, ability to move forward on the things that we feel like we need to do. And I would say that Pilate and Herod both were guilty of this. And we uh, see this recorded in Luke 23. They both made some kind of statement to Jesus, some variation of, hey, I see that you're not evil, uh, that, you are, that you are probably good, uh, and you're probably innocent, but I'm not willing to do anything about it. I'm still going to turn you over to others. They had authority, but they allowed their authority to be limited by their circumstances. How many of us are in positions like that? Where we have some authority over something. Maybe it's just in our own household, or maybe it's at a workplace or something. But, but we allow the expectations of others to speak more into that authority than we'll allow Christ to speak into that authority. Let's let this face-to-face encounter with Jesus change everything. With a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, we submit to him. That's a reasonable response. I broke submission into four categories. First one is this, our submission to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Luke 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. He said it in other places too. Hey, if you love me, you'll do the things I say. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. And that's not exactly a popular thing to say. You know, because love, there's freedom. I can do whatever I want to do. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is making. <laughs> yeah, you have freedom to do what you want to do. But what will you do? This passage in uh, John 14, uh, uh, go back and read it. There's a, a, a bunch of promises loaded uh, in this, uh, uh, these few verses here. One, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit that that he will send the Holy Spirit to us. We have the promise that he will not abandon us. We have the promise that we will see him. We have the promise that he will live in us. We have the promise that the Father will love us. We have the promise that Christ will make himself known to us. These are significant promises. But they follow submission. Second category, our submission to authorities. And again, this one, depending on your sphere of influence, it may or may not be popular. 
First Peter 2 talks about um, uh, submitting to human authority. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. Romans 13 talks about this as well. Everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. And in a democracy, we don't know what to do with that verse because we selected these people to be in authority over us. I think in some ways, being a Christian in a democracy is way more difficult than we would like to think. I was kind of a political science guy for a little while in college, and I have all kinds of thoughts and opinions politically. I'll keep those to myself, mostly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's tough, like because we, we don't know what to do with submission to people that we elect into office. We, we, don't, we don't know what to do with that. It's such a weird thing. I mean, we, when we read this, at least the way I picture it, you know, we think, oh, back in the old days, you know, the authorities were kind of self-appointed, and they uh, were brutal. And so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But how do we apply that in our culture today? I don't have any great answers, by the way. That's kind of a, request, a question that I would like to discuss more. <laughs> All right? I would like your feedback on that. How do, we, how do we apply that today? How do we apply that at the local, the state, and the national level? Titus 3, 1. Remind the believers, us, the church, to submit to authority and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. 1 Peter 2 takes a, a different uh, angle, and I think this applies to the workplace as much as uh, uh, the relationship that's described here. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. Well, what about my rights? You know, what about my protections? What about my... Yeah, I get it. This is tough. It's not popular. There's some exceptions, of course. Acts 5.29 says this, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. If the human authority is telling you to do something against the will of God, don't do it. It's as simple as that. Which authority are you going to obey? <clears throat> Hebrews 12.9 I think is uh, important in this context as well. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, hopefully we did, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? You know, parents, you guys have some responsibility as well to, to discipline your children. And children, regardless of your age, submit to the authority that your parents have. You don't outgrow that. Submit to their authority, but within reason, within the reason of the kingdom of God. What is permissible in the kingdom of God? Obey God rather than any human authority. Ephesians 5 uh, talks about the last two types of submission that I want to introduce this morning. The first one of those two from uh, Ephesians 5 is this one, our submission to one another. Ephesians 5.21, I uh, heard this yesterday at a wedding, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In this text, it's not just for the husband and wife, this is still addressing the church at large. Uh, then the next verse immediately rolls into wives and husbands and all that. But we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So how do we do that as the body of Christ? How do we submit? How do I submit to you? I mean, just thinking about us in this room, how do we, how do we submit to one another? Well, there's a few other words, I think, that are uh, used uh, in this text and other places that, uh, that maybe we understand a little bit better. Love one another. Respect one another. Honor one another. That's how we submit to one another. This uh, Ephesians 5 text goes on to um, explain uh, the fourth category that I have for us this morning, the church's submission to Christ. Ephesians 5.24, as the church submits to Christ, and then paints this picture of a husband and wife. I've heard distortions of this passage where, uh, where particularly the male is encouraged to dominate the female. They obviously clearly have not read the rest of Scripture. In John 14, Jesus said, hey, if you love me, you'll obey me. We looked at that a few minutes ago. And from this text, and based on these definitions, we can gather that the husband is now instructed to obey to love his wife, right? That's what it says a little bit later. To, to love his wife. Well, loving is obeying, uh, based on other texts. Submitting to his wife. It's a picture of mutual submission, not one dominating the other. 
And what an amazing covenant picture that is. Tony's done a couple uh, different series uh, over the years about covenant. I can't remember when the last one was, but two, probably two years ago. Um, again, these are all archived on the website. You can go back and, and listen to these, but uh, explaining what a covenant is and how that works in our day and time. So this picture of a husband and wife of a marriage, it's a beautiful picture of Christ and the church. We see through this picture and through other texts uh, as well that Christ is submitted to the Father. Christ could have taken everything for himself. He was tempted to do so. He declined all that because he said, you know what, my Father's way is better. Yeah, I, yeah, I could have the whole world. I created the whole world, but uh, you know, it could be all mine. But the Father's way is better. And everything I say and do, I do because of the Father and because that's what he has given me. In Matthew 26, 39, this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went on a little farther and he bowed with his face to the ground saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. The will, the will of the father, not mine. And again, submission is not the most exciting subject, right? And you guys, hopefully you're with me still, you're not feeling too beat up yet. We get to the blessing part here in a second. It's not fireworks and burning bushes, but it's the small choices day in and day out. Steadfast submission is an act of worship. Some days this steadfast submission is all we can do. You know, we, we might have a dream, a vision for something bigger, and, and uh, um, you know, a lot of these dreams and visions don't happen with a single leap. It happens through slow, steady submission to the will of the Father. 1 Samuel 15, 22, um, Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. A couple more comments about submission before we get to blessing. The church is only effective when it is submitted to Christ. This thing here, this, this thing that we do every Sunday morning and, and more um, uh, conceptually uh, with the bigger body of Christ is only effective when we are submitted to Christ. And the Christian as an individual is only alive and free when submitted to Christ. Transitioning into blessing, blessing follows submission. And again, I want to be careful with this statement because I don't ever want to minimize the work of Christ on the cross. Sometimes we can, we can get this mindset of, I'm going to submit to God so I can get whatever. <laughs> that's, that's not why we do this. Jesus came to us first. We didn't win God's approval by our good behavior, our uh, 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 daily obedience. Yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Remember that. Don't forget that. It was his sacrifice that, that purchased our freedom. And now we're free to choose whom we will follow. Will we submit to the way of the cross or will we submit to self? As we talk about blessing, again, uh, the definition that I offered earlier, uh, blessing is God's favor and protection. Scripture has a lot to say about God's favor and protection. I've listed a few things for you guys this morning, but I would really just encourage you to uh, even use the Bible app or whatever uh, 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 resources that, that you prefer. Go through and just start reading some of the verses that talk about blessing. Here's a few. Uh, Job twenty two twenty one. Submit to God and you will have peace. Then things will go well for you. Some of you guys might be in a, in a position where you just don't have peace. Things are not going well. Anybody, anybody there? <laughs> uh, submit to God. Things will go well for you when you do. Our circumstances are whatever they are. Uh, th and I just want to add a little comment right now before I get too far into these. That, that sometimes uh, people will make the, the same. Well, I don't see this as true in my life. I don't, I'm, I'm not experiencing God's peace. Therefore, his blessing must not be upon me. His favor must not be on, uh, upon me. And that's not the truth either. Um, there's a million reasons why you might not see the evidence of this thing. But if you're submitted to Christ, you are not the reason that you're not seeing the evidence of that. 
Trust God and his timing to do his work. Remain obedient to the things that he has called you to do. Second Chronicles 30 verse 8 talks about avoiding the wrath of God. Don't be stubborn as they were, but submit yourselves to the Lord. Kind of an interesting perspective on stubbornness here. Don't be stubborn for the things of this world, but be stubborn for the things of the Lord. Um, a little bit of a difference there, okay? Uh, come to his temple, which he has set apart forever as holy. Worship the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. And there's a whole bunch of verses that talk about his fierce anger. Psalm 128, we see the blessing of family. Um, uh, Psalm 128 lists out the wife, the children, the grandchildren. This is the Lord's blessing for those who fear him. Um, what an amazing gift that family is. Psalm 1611 um, uh, explains blessing as his presence. Uh, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living you, with you forever. How good is that? Being with the Lord forever. Psalm 212 talks about joy, the blessing of joy that comes as we submit to the Lord. Submit to God's royal son or he will become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant. That's part of that justice that we talked about a few weeks ago. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. Again, your circumstances are whatever they are, but you can have joy despite your circumstances as you walk with the Lord. There's also the blessing of eternal life as we submit to the Lord our God. John 3:36 uh, talks about believing, and in, in this uh, text, John seems to use these words, believing and obeying interchangeably. Believing is not just having head knowledge about something and thinking that it might be true or hoping that it's true. But believing is about a changed life and that evidence being demonstrated through obedience. Uh, this verse, John 3.36 says this, And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but remain under God's angry judgment. There's a blessing of legacy in Deuteronomy 26. 16 through 19. I know I'm reading through these verses really quick, but that's why you have it in the app, and that's why I have it up on the screen, so you can go back and read these more. This was so good. I'm going to read this, okay? Today, the Lord your God, I've been reading all the other ones too. I'm not going to apologize for reading this one too. Uh, Today, the Lord your God has commanded you to obey all of these decrees and regulations, so be careful to obey them wholeheartedly. You have declared today that the Lord is your God, and you have promised to walk in his ways, to obey his decrees, commands, and regulations, and to do everything he tells you. That's submission. The Lord has declared today that you are his own people, his own special treasure, just as he promised, uh, and that you must obey all his commands. And if you do, he will set you high above all the other nations he has made. We're talking about the kingdom of God, right? I mean, this Old Testament stuff, but the, the New Life, or the New Testament translation is kingdom of God. Uh, uh, that's the, the kingdom that we're a part of. He will set the kingdom of God, I'm going to par- paraphrase this, uh, uh, above all the other nations he has made. Then you will receive praise, honor, and renown. You'll be a nation that is holy to the Lord your God, just as he promised. John 1.16 talks about one blessing after another. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 23, we see the motivation for everything that Paul does. Um, I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessings. Um, uh, you know, Paul, Paul understood this, uh, that submission to God results in incredible blessings. And this blessing is the good news that we get to share uh, around the world. So in response to, to, uh, to the blessing of submission, I have a question that I would love for you guys to reflect on. And the reflection question is this, what is one thing that you are controlling, that you are trying to manipulate, that you are trying to um, you know, keep in your hands? <laughs> What's that one thing that you need to let go of and submit to the Lord your God? Take some time this week. If you want to talk about it, I'd love to, I'd love to listen. I'd love to hear um, about this thing and would love to pray with you and walk with you through this. One of the other amazing blessings of submission, and it's only because of the obedience of Christ to, uh, to the point of the cross, is communion. 
We get to participate in communion, walking this thing out together, seeing uh, uh, God, uh, seeing the evidence of God in us and through us and around us, uh, through the taking of uh, bread and through the drinking of the cup. I was reading this book by uh, Henry Nowen. He was talking about communion. And he, I think this is helpful for us to understand. He said this, communion is not the end. Mission is. Communion is not the end. This table, coming to this table is not the end, but mission is. Because what this table represents is the work that still needs to happen until Christ returns. We remember the broken body. We remember the blood spilled. But we remember it so we can step away from the table and really, in a sense, take this table out to the world to let them know about the King, the Christ, who died for them. This table is not the destination. Mission is. Let's be mobilized in taking this thing out. Henry Nowen went on to say, go and tell. <laughs> you know, you come to the table, but go and tell of this table. Here's another picture uh, from Luke 14. Jesus went to dinner at the home of a religious leader, uh, a Pharisee. And at this dinner, uh, because it's just Jesus doing what Jesus does, he healed a sick man, and he challenged the theology of his host. As he was there, he watched many of the guests clamor to the place of honor at the head of the table. And I, um, I'm, a, I'm a visual guy, and so I kind of paint a picture in my head, and I just kind of picture Jesus just kind of standing up against the wall, kind of maybe in the corner of the room, just kind of watching. Like, man, there's so much more that they could be living for. There's so much more to this life than sitting at that spot Hey guys, let me tell you something. And Jesus turned and started talking to some of the guests. He shared a basic truth, is what scripture says. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. There's a promise in that. You guys hear that? Another promise of blessing following submission. Then he turned to his host. He turned to the, the religious leader, the guy who should have known better. He turned to this guy and said, hey, look, there's potential here. <laughs> Don't just invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors. For they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. You, know, you get a meal in return. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Do you want your blessing to be another meal in return? Or do you want your blessing to be the favor of God and his protection? Church, may our table be filled with those who cannot repay. Who of us could possibly re repay King Jesus? May we fully appreciate our humble beginnings and the honor it is to approach this table this morning. May this church, I'm talking to us, in this room. May this church be filled with people who understand their great need. Luke 14, 15 shares this extra little tidbit. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table, we don't know who this was, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, and you know, here's that face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. That's why we do this. That's why we come to the table. That's why we partake in uh, uh, communion. But that's also why we go and tell when we're done here. What a blessing it'll be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. I just want to remind us that we can't enjoy the blessing of, com uh, of communion without submission to the king. This morning, as, as you're maybe reflecting on communion, a couple questions. Has your submission waned. Come to the table. Come to the Father who forgives. Do you need God to breathe life into your soul again? Come to the table. Come to the Christ who promised that he will never leave you. Are you feeling the weight of your circumstances? 
of your struggles and pains. Come to the table. Come to the one who proclaims that you are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I want to wrap up this portion of the service with uh, Romans 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. And those who are uh, helping us with communion, if you guys would come forward while we're praying. Uh, Lord, this morning, we, we, want to, um, we want to receive your blessing. We want to receive your favor and your protection. Uh, but we know that that comes uh, at the cost of submission to your kingship. Lord, this morning, we dedicate our lives to you once again. We just ask for you to uh, show us any, any error in our ways, anything that we need to give up, anything that we need to submit to you, any unforgiveness that we're harboring, uh, any forgiveness that we need to extend. Uh, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would just uh, uh, continue the work of molding us and shaping us into the men and women of God that you have designed us, created us, destined for us to be. Lord, I pray that, um, that we would not just have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus and then walk away unchanged. But Lord, I pray that you would change us from the inside out, from the depth of our being to the hands from the, the thoughts in our heads uh, to our feet. Lord, I pray that you would change us from the inside out, that we would be the evidence of your goodness and kindness in this broken world. We're gonna sing this song together this morning. I just wanna ask you guys, uh, uh, if you're following Jesus, if, if Jesus is your king, uh, come to the table, grab the bread, grab the cup, and return to your seats. We're gonna take communion all together here in just a moment.